Let's now look at the energy output side of the energy balance equation, that is, how we spend our calories. Our body uses most of the energy for two purposes, basal metabolism and physical activity. On top of that, we also need to spend a little amount of energy to digest and utilize the food we eat. Our basal metabolism, or basal metabolic rate, is the energy we need to spend to perform our basic vital functions such as breathing, pumping our heart, and allowing all of our organs to function. In other words, this is the energy we need to just survive without doing anything. Ideally, this would be calculated for a resting body in a fasting state in a warm and quiet environment. But in real life, most of the time we're not completely rested, not completely fasted and not in a quiet and warm environment, and so we need to spend a little bit more energy on top of that. For practical purposes, this energy is still included in the calculation of our basal metabolism. What is not included, however, is the extra energy we need to perform from all of our physical activities, such as walking or washing the dishes, as well as the energy we need to digest and utilize food. For a sedentary person, Basal metabolism accounts for 60 to 70 percent of the whole energy expenditure, and it is influenced by many different factors. One is body composition. Our lean body mass, such as our muscles, needs more energy even at rest compared to our adipose tissue, and so the more lean mass we have, the higher our basal metabolism. This is also the reason why, when everything else is equal, men have higher basal metabolism than women, since women are genetically designed to have more fat mass. And this is also the main strategy we have to change our basal metabolism. By doing physical activity to increase our lean mass, we can increase our basal metabolism and therefore burn more calories even when we are at rest, on top of those spent to perform the activity itself. Another factor increasing basal metabolism is a larger body surface area per body volume. Taller people have larger body surface areas and for this reason they use more calories at rest than shorter people and are less prone to obesity. The temperature of our environment also affects basal metabolism. In particular, temperature extremes will always increase basal metabolism because we need to spend energy to keep our body temperature stable. Raising our body temperature if it's cold and keeping it cool if it's warm both require to spend some energy, just like our air conditioners need electricity both to warm up and to cool down our buildings. Particularly cold environmental conditions will also cause some involuntary physical activity such as increased muscle tone, fidgeting or shivering, further increasing energy expenditure. Thyroid hormones directly affect our basal metabolism because they set the pace of our body's metabolic rate. Hyperthyroidism results in higher basal metabolism and difficulty to gain weight. Vice versa, hypothyroidism results in lower basal metabolism and therefore a tendency to gain weight. Stress also increases our basal metabolism, mainly through the activity of our nervous system and the higher circulating levels of stress hormones such as adrenaline. Our basal metabolism can also be increased by thermogenic substances, that is, substances which increase our energy expenditure, such as caffeine, nicotine, ephedra, capsaicin, and drugs such as amphetamine and ephedrine. For this reason, coffee, green tea, red peppers, or ephedra tea have been used to help in many weight loss diets. Cigarette smoking is another option, but it is definitely not a smart way to induce thermogenesis. Finally, our basal metabolism is affected by homeostatic adjustments to food intake. As we said before, our body tries to match our energy intake to our energy expenditure, so if we eat a little bit more than what we spend, it will try to dissipate some of that extra energy, for example by dissipating a little heat or involuntarily shaking a foot or fidgeting with a pen. Some people are more efficient than others at maintaining body weight in spite of overeating thanks to thermogenesis. On the other hand, if we eat a little less than what we spend, our metabolic rate will also slow down to save some energy. If our food intake suddenly drops to severely restricted caloric intake, our basal metabolism also drops immediately by about 10 to 20 percent because our body recognizes the situation as an emergency and switches to conservation mode. It's sort of our body's way of going to standby. For example, our thyroid hormones production will drop, while our cells become more efficient at storing fat.
for example, by increasing the activity of the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. Finally, our genes have once again an important word. Every other factor being equal, different persons will still have different basal metabolic rates, and this depends on their different genetic makeup. So let's recap the main factors that influence our basal metabolism. These are body composition, body surface area, temperature, thyroid hormone, stress, use of thermogenic substances, homeostatic adjustments to food intake, and our genetic makeup. One question that is often asked by people interested in losing weight is, can I increase my basal metabolism so that I can burn more calories even when I sleep? From what we said, there are indeed some ways to increase one's basal metabolism. The best way is to change body composition by doing physical activity to increase the amount of muscle because lean mass requires more energy to be maintained. Another strategy is to lower the temperature of our home by one or two degrees as long as it's still comfortable. Finally, we can make a moderate use of safe thermogenic substances such as caffeine. Instead, abusing thermogenic substances, smoking or using thermogenic or thyroid-stimulating drugs just for the purpose of increasing basal metabolism is dangerous and should absolutely be avoided. Let's now examine the other two components of energy expenditure, which are the energy spent for physical activity and the thermogenic effect of food. The energy spent for physical activity is greatly variable from person to person depending on how active they are. A very active athlete may spend more energy for physical activity than he spends for his basal metabolism, and he will have a very high total energy requirement. Most individuals, however, even if physically active, will normally spend less energy for physical activity than they need for their basal metabolism. A sedentary person will spend less than 20% of his energy for physical activity. The energy spent for physical activity is not only the energy required to perform the activity itself, which is basically muscle contraction, but it is also the energy that is needed afterwards to repair tissues and restore normal conditions, for example, to clear lactic acid. For this reason, energy expenditure stays elevated for a while even after physical activity itself has ended. This is another concept that people interested in losing weight should keep in mind about physical activity. Number one, we spend calories to perform the activity itself. But also, number two, we keep spending calories even after we have exercises to repair and restore our tissues. And on top of all that, number three, we increase our basal metabolic rate by increasing our muscle mass, which means we spend more calories even when we sleep. Let's now move on to the last component of energy expenditure, which is called thermic effect of food. This is the energy we need to spend to be able to digest, absorb, and process nutrients from food. The three macronutrients contribute differently to the thermic effect. Lipids require the least energy to be used, while protein require the most. About 20 to 30% of the energy contained in proteins needs to be used just to make these proteins available. The thermic effect of carbs is 5 to 10% of their energy content, while the one of fats is between 0 and 3%. When we say that proteins provide 4 calories per gram, we have already discounted the thermic effect of food. If we burn 1 gram of protein, it will actually release 5.65 calories, but we estimate that that 1.65 on top is what needs to be spent on average just to process them. The same goes for the 9 calories per gram of lipids and the 4 calories per gram of carbs. These values are actually approximations used to discount thermogenesis and are called at-water conversion factors, from the name of the scientist who first proposed them about a century ago. In reality, the total thermic effect of a meal is variable and also depends on the total amount of food we eat. If we eat a lot at the same time, the thermic effect is a little higher. Alcohol also has a thermic effect, which is about 20%, of its energy content. So let's recap. Our energy expenditure, the energy output side of the energy balance equation, is the sum of three components. Our basal metabolism, which is the energy we need to spend to survive and perform our basic vital functions. The energy spent to perform our physical activities, from walking to washing the dishes, to exercising at the gym. And the thermic effect of food, the energy we spend to digest, absorb, and metabolize nutrients from food. Particular physiologic states such as growth, pregnancy, or lactation of course further increase energy expenditure, as well as the stress of illness, 
hypermetabolic state due to fever, infection, inflammation, wounds, trauma, disease, or surgery, when extra energy is spent to raise body temperature, to repair damaged tissue, and to synthesize white blood cells and inflammatory mediators to respond to an infection. Some conditions, such as extensive burns or cystic fibrosis, are extremely hypercatabolic and cause extremely high energy expenditures.